Just to prove, I do have notes. I just found them. Here they are. And uh, <laughs> I, I probably could do this next section talking to uh, members of church council, pastors, and so forth without the notes, but uh, I tried to condense down a lot of years of my uh, experiences as a, as a pastor, the kinds of things that I at least came to understand about what's the role of the church council, not, not, in, um, not different than what the bylaws spell out, because it's pretty clear about the duties and the job and assignment, but I'm, I'm talking more how do, how do we work together as a, as a council and a pastor, how does all that kind of ha happen? And I just wanted to be sure that I uh, would, would cover all of those. But um, before I uh, begin talking particularly about a church council, uh, if those of you who are not on a council and never plan to be on one, you know, for whatever reason, I, I don't think that this next section will be without value for you. Because if we're dealing with spiritual principles, or at least things that work with people, then whatever setting you're in where there's a group of people doing stuff, I, I hope some of that will be helpful. I do want to just make a little commercial plug here to say if there's any chance you can come to the seminar, seminar tomorrow evening. Seminar is the wrong word, it's, but I don't know what else to call it. On the subject of grace. But let me tell you what I'm up against, because, oh yeah, grace, I mean... <laughs> Grace, I mean, hallelujah, grace, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it seems pretty simple, but I tell you, I've just had an experience these last three years essentially trying to answer two questions. First of all, since I know I am forgiven and I'm going to heaven, I'm saved by grace, I really know that. Where then does this horrific guiltiness, this sense of uh, reproach and disqualification, that those days when you just feel like you've blown it so badly that God doesn't want to talk to you for another week? What's up with that? Where does that come from? And I don't think I'd ever pause to really ask where that came from. I just presumed that that's the consequence of sin. And when you've sinned, you feel bad. And, and people would say it's a conviction and not condemnation. Thanks. Still feels rotten. Where does that come from? And is it really the Holy Spirit? That's one question. And then secondly, how does the law fit with grace. And I know all of the Christian verbiage, and it doesn't help. I know how to convince you that I know more than you do, but I never really understood the mechanics of how these two work together. The law is be good. Grace is be forgiven. So if I'm not good, can I still be forgiven? And for how long can I not be good, or how not good can I be and still be forgiven? Theologically, we kind of know. But deep down, there's this feeling that maybe you've been not good for too long, and you're presuming on the grace of God. So I wanted a firm Bible study answer to these questions, and it has rocked my world. So that's tomorrow night. Okay, church councils. <clears throat> I want to begin by saying thank you to those of you who are on the church councils. I believe that my church council was one of the single most important gatherings of our church. And the longer that I pastored, the more vital it became to me. And I would say in the last probably six, seven years of my pastoring, the monthly church council meeting was the meeting that I looked forward to more than any other. And that's not because we had a lot of money. <laughs> it was just what we ended up with with that group of people. And uh, yeah, fantastic. So thank you. You as a church council represent a strata in, 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 in church. You know, you have the maybe the more public or designated leaders, and then you have another layer or tier of leaders, and then you have, you know, another, and so forth. 
And the church council was always in my mind a great uh, cross sampling of my congregation. You know, these people that want to find out if volcanoes went off back in the Ice Age will drill down into glaciers and they come up with these long tubes of ice and then they, they look at what the particles or something were in the ice. To me, a church council is a fantastic way to bore down into my congregation and find out what's really uh, going on. So I found them quite keen. Spiritually speaking, there's two things that a church council, I believe, does. And I'm always more interested in the spiritual stuff than in the, the, the more material things. Um, the first is, let me tell you, remind you of the story when the spies were sent into the promised land. You know, there were 12 that went in, all 12 came back, but only two had a good report saying, hey, we can do this, we can do this. The other 10 said, yeah, it'd be really great to eat grapes as big as watermelons, but the fruit is big, but so are the bad guys. So I don't really think we can get the good, good sized fruit because of the good sized enemies. And they backed away. Here's my first startling statement of the night. Where your church can end up going is as much a result of this mid-level leader as it is of the pastor, him or herself. These spies, I mean, Moses had a vision. God had a plan. But these spies who brought back a less than encouraging report, in my book, are ultimately responsible for 38 years of wandering in the, in the wilderness. Now Moses made his mistake, but that was after they were out wandering. I'm not saying this to put like, oh my goodness, pressure, I wish I wouldn't have known, I never would have said yes to doing this, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying think about yourself biblically, spiritually. I'm glad you're, if you're a business person, I'm glad. If you're an attorney, I'm, I'm, I'm glad about all that. But I don't want you on my council just because you're some unspiritual, well, I guess we need an accountant on our church. Why? The numbers aren't that complicated. The office that you've said yes to is, to me, very spiritual. And your report how you see the future that you get invited into by your pastor. You sometimes, you know, in these, these meetings, we're talking about this and that, you're being asked to go into the future that your pastor believes is a vision from God, a calling from God, it's part of our inheritance. So when you go in, don't just go in as a natural thinker. Don't go in as a non-thinker, please. Don't be an airhead for Christ. Yep, they asked me to be on the council. I'm not really sure why. No, I mean, think. But you are a spiritual person. And we learn in the scripture that what we see with the natural eye is not the same as what we see with the spiritual eye. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, um, basically, that he who is spiritual... Not woo -woo, spooky. I don't want any spookiness in my church, not in my council, anywhere. If you don't walk on the ground, you know what? Go someplace else. <coughs> he who is spiritual, pardon me, spiritually appraises all things. Meaning, God doesn't see like man sees. Now, I understand that in the larger church world, there are a lot of uh, uh, crazy people who have announced the future of God. Uh, and they don't have any word from the Lord. They just have visions of grandeur. Of course, as a council member, you want to keep your pastor from going off the deep end. 
spiritually appraised. Don't look as the natural man looks. Natural man looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. A spiritual person understands that everything we see in this natural world was created by a word of the Lord. And so a vision, if it's truly from God, a vision, the, the, the plan of God, the word of the Lord to a congregation, it has a creative dynamic to it that as we choose to believe that promise, it can call into being what doesn't even exist. And if I'm a natural person, then I only count the beings that I have. If I'm a spiritual person, I know that God can flood with whatever resource is needed. And this is why, now I I'm, I'm think I'm maybe to my first point, although it's not on my numbers, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming around. I fly a lot, so, you know, I, I eventually land, but it takes a while to come down. I found this very helpful in talking to my counsel. I tried to, when I was asking them to embrace a future that was going to require some uh, change, some faith, some, you know, something that's not just the ordinary. I tried to tell them if my understanding, is this an issue of faith or an issue of faithfulness? Because we're called to be both people of faith but also to be faithful. And faithfulness is I look in the bank account and I've been careful with that and we have plenty so to build the playground structure that's going to cost $6,000, uh, we have the money We've been faithful and we can make an informed decision. But sometimes what God asks us to step into is not out of faithfulness to the resources we have, but believing him for what he's going to provide. And I think you will find that this, at least for us, it helped immeasurably that even more than talking about should we do the play structure, should we, uh, you know, repave the asphalt, should we uh, send these three mission teams, even more than the specifics, we tried to resolve, do we believe that this is a calling of God to be faithful with what we have, with what he's already given, or is this something where he's asking us to step in faith? And counsel, if you can help discern between those two, you will protect your pastor, but you will also encourage uh, and support your pastor very, very well. That was maybe one of the biggest uh, takeaways of all of our years, the difference between things that were matters of faithfulness or matters of, of faith. And I really just asked the Lord, is this something I'm to step out on? Or maybe we just wait for five months and we set aside a little chunk of change. That doesn't hurt anything to say, well, let's see. We believe God is going to provide, so why don't we watch him provide over the next two months before we leap off the cliff? You don't always have to you know, do it in reverse order. So that was really important. All of this is to say, spiritually, one of your big assignments is to go into the future, the, the, uh, uh, ahead of you, but also bring back a report of what's up ahead for the future. You can't talk about things that went on in the council meeting, but, you know, much of it's confidential. But I've always been curious why, I mean, I've met more than one council person, okay? And present company, absolutely excluded, I'm sure. But a lot of council people never say anything. The only time you ever hear them say anything is when they get up all embarrassed and it's pastor's birthday, we're going to take a collection, so I've been asked by the rest of the council to sort of, you know, I'm going to sort of, you know, good for you. I mean, you're my heroes that you get up there and do that. But... I mean, thank you, but you're much more significant than an announcement about the pastor's uh, anniversary cruise. We're sending him for as long as we can, you know. <laughs> Within the bounds of confidentiality and not disclosing stuff that would be inappropriate, 
I think the church council being excited about the future and uh, declaring their belief in what God is doing, just, just saying simple things like, I tell you, I love this church. I, we have council meetings. Trust me, there's too many details to go into. But man, I'm telling you, this is a rocking place. Your words can permeate a congregation and be a fantastic chorus to help a congregation grab a hold of the future. So don't be a bump on a log that only comes alive at a council meeting. Talk. Okay, so that's number one, going into the land and bringing back a good report. The second spiritual thing that a council does, we find this in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, or 6, right-hand page, left-hand right -hand column. And he says this. Sorry. I should have put more in my notes. I know. Am I torturing you teachers? You're like, can't the man just stick with one line of thinking? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I can. I have. I'm not. We have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of man. It was Paul talking about a pretty good-sized offering that had been taken. And so they're, how do they administrate this money? And he says, we're very careful. Basically, we do nothing that would be hmm, in God's eyes and nothing that would be questionable on good business practices. You are not helping your pastor if you just say, well, we trust you, pastor. You know, whatever. <laughs> That's good. Oh, thanks for the sermon. Because let's give the benefit of the doubt. Your pastor's not trying to do anything funny or squirrely. But the temptation to, I don't know, yeah, I'll give you a good for instance to show you how <laughs> sometimes vacant we can be. I did a lot of work years ago in the nation of Switzerland, and I was going there like four times a year. This was a long time ago, really not, no debit cards. I mean, what's a computer, etc. And so when I went there, I would have to exchange money, take my American dollars, get the Swiss francs. And I thought, what a hassle. Maybe I just should have Swiss money. So I, in good conscience, not even realizing, I said to the council, I said, I think it would be really great if we opened up a Swiss bank account for me. <laughs> okay, now I'm not, I'm not thinking that kind of Swiss bank account. I'm thinking a, a bank account in Switzerland. And one of my council people, they, they, they said, I don't feel good about this at all. And I'm like, what's the problem? And they said, you know, if people heard about this, it would raise questions. And friends, we don't have to do anything that raises questions. And as a church council member, you want to make sure everything is, is in line. I'm pretty, pretty um, let's just say fanatical about uh, financial accountability. If you saw our monthly report, I mean, it'd freak you out. It was like seven pages long, every little thing. <laughs> Boring in one way. Do you, do you like the little things or you not so like the little? Accountant. Oh, accountant? <laughs> yeah, they're probably just thinking, oh, yeah, that's normal. But I'm, for me, it's like, oh, everything. But there was not a question not a single question where even one penny for all the years that I pastored, except the first three weeks when I church planted. Not that there's a question about where the money went, but I knew I was in trouble. We take the offering home. We have no office. We have nothing. I've got this cash of money, and I was terrified of it. I mean, I threw it on this one little, and I'm like, oh, oh somebody get it out of here. I just, I, I'm not comfortable. But it's just me, we just church planting, and so I'm doing the books, right? With three weeks gone by, even using a pencil, whiteout, and an eraser. You know, if it doesn't... Okay. 
Not a, I, really, on this one, I, I, I'm telling you, not a single funny thing going on. But not good that people see the pastor take the money home. I mean, better than just offering. Would anybody else like to take this home? <laughs> you know, I, I felt like I was stuck, but it was, it was panic engendering in me. And so I just grabbed somebody and I said, I'm sorry, you now are going to have to do this. What a relief for me to know as a leader, there is nothing funny, questionable, whatever. And we would say to our congregation, if you're a member of this church, you may come uh, and look at the books at any time you want. If you're not a member, it's none of your business. Help your pastor. Make sure there is some adequate, even if you have got to hire an accountant or somebody, make sure that that's taken care of. I could tell you stories that would freak you out. Shall I tell you? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm watching. I I'm, I'm just got seven points. I'll tell you when I start the first one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> A Foursquare pastor, pastored for a number of years, somehow personally got involved in a, a, a great investment arrangement. And, you know, it's one of these things where he was, was too good to be true, and of course it was. If, if it is too good to be true, it is not true. And uh, he was making some pretty good returns, and he thought this was so fantastic that he would let his congregation in on all of this. And uh, he was kind of the middle person between his c congregation and the person that he was investing with and wrote up these, uh, I don't know you call them, bills of sale. That's the wrong word for it, but you can tell how. Anyway, <laughs> on church stationery. And even though Foursquare family had absolutely nothing to do with anything that was going on when it all collapsed. Guess who suffered a lawsuit where we had to pay out a huge chunk of our tithe dollars? Because a pastor used church stationery to write out these transactions or an IOU or something like that and because our, yeah, I mean it's just brainless. I'm sorry, brainless but it goes on all the time. Most pastors are not trained in this, uh, this arena. I'm just saying help them, okay? Seven points <clears throat> about church council meetings. Number one, you can hear that. Oh, feels good, doesn't it? Number one, uh, how we did, this, I'm talking now about our church council uh, meetings. My ultimate goal was to convince all the council members that as a group we are of one mind. But every normal person goes back and forth in their mind on any given issue. It doesn't mean I don't like myself. It doesn't mean I'm like so conflicted. I'm just going back and forth. And when a council tries to reach unanimity too quickly, when the feeling is, well, you know, they all feel it, but well, okay, I'll just go along with it. We're really robbing our leaders of the best counsel, which is to have people really go back and forth at the council meeting so that we can uh, come up with the best solution. So does that make, it, you understand that? Being of one mind is not the same as insisting that everybody uh, feels the same about this right away. But point number two is we tended not to do anything until being of one mind, we had resolved on one decision. So I wanted a unanimous decision from the council, but not early on. I think the more discussion you have, um, yeah, the better. Number three, see how quickly we're going? Once you get numbers, I just whip through them. Number three, very important. Each council person's voice is critical to the equation. 
my experience was that uh, if you have a council of however many members, there's always a few that, that, that just don't say much at all. Uh, not on my councils. If you don't say much, guess what? All right, tell me what you think. You haven't said much. What do you think? And even if you, what you think is the same as what somebody else thinks, I would say, you say it. Don't just, yeah, I'm, I'm with Bob on this one. What did Bob say? I want to hear. And the reason for that is because, again, you look in Scripture, and many, many times the word of the Lord comes to an individual person. And they're not like, you know, waiting for the word, Lord, here I am. It just comes to them. So I wanted my counsel to feel that each one of you, you, we don't know in this discussion who's going to receive the prompting, who's going to receive something from, from the Lord. So don't count yourself out. You don't have to be a blabbermouth, but, but, but don't imagine, well, I'm, just, I'm not that important. I don't really know anything about this stuff. I don't think that's the deal, that you have to know about building codes. But I think if you've got, you know, it's funny, this thought just keeps coming to me, especially when it's a scripture. Every voice is critical. Now, we did a, um, something I'm really happy that we did. I don't know if you, any of your councils, any of you, when you elect, you have a point, you have both the husband and wife or both the wife and the husband on your council. You doing that? Rocking. Yeah. You know, as far as I know, I'm, this is my last attempt to impress you. All others, all others have failed, so I'm going to try. As far as I know in Foursquare, we were the originators of that. Nobody had ever done it before. Yes, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> we, well, if you do it, then you know it really, really works. And it made the food so much better. Every, <laughs> sorry, every council meeting began with a meal. And in our minutes, we actually post what was served for dinner. <laughs> and that's only because I'm not as, I wasn't as kind then as I am now. And I was thinking to myself, years from now, somebody's going to go back through these archives and they're going to read these council minutes because we kept them very, very meticulously. And they're going to read about some fantastic dinner and wish that they were there. Uh, yeah, so I want to make sure everybody uh, can talk. We made a big deal out of saying, you know, if, if your spouse is uh, sick or out of town or something, don't you not come just because your spouse can't come. And we didn't count the couple's vote as one vote. They were individually, everybody gets to vote. And all of this was to make the statement, you are very important and don't be afraid uh, to speak your mind. That leads me to point number four. Man. No one, I'm trying not to smile. <clears throat> no one has to explain their feelings. They just, I don't know. I, I just, I'm. you don't have to make your thought comprehensible. I mean, try. Perhaps I'll just tell you where this came from and it will explain it much better than what I'm trying. I don't know what my fingers were doing either. There. <laughs> okay, really, get a life, would you? Um, it was one of the, uh, the finer lessons that I learned uh, years ago as a man who'd been married for a number of years. I'm not a quick learner, but I do remember this fine lesson that I learned that seemed to change a great deal. And it was when I got down off my high horse and uh, no longer insisted that my wife would explain things to me in language that I could understand. You know what? Sometimes you just can't put it into words. And I have learned to, to trust sometimes people's discernment and they can't give you a logical explanation for why this doesn't seem good or doesn't seem right. So to this day, it just happened uh, yesterday, I, 
I asked my wife, hey, have a possibility of, you know, on my way to such and such, I can maybe go by and see these people in this country. And she says, I don't know why, I just don't feel good about that. To me, it's a done deal. I don't, well, why? So that was a fine lesson that I learned. <laughs> it's only the ladies who are nodding right now. <laughs> Well, and I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like that. It's just prophetic people can't always explain what they're doing. I just want you to register there's something about this that doesn't sit well with you. And because we go back to this unanimity, maybe it's just a question of, uh, of more time that has to go by until it is a great idea. Or maybe there's stuff that we can't possibly see in our calculations and what we know, but, but somebody's getting a thought, it's the alert of the Lord protecting from something that might be out there in the future. So I, if I trust people enough to invite them on my counsel, I trust them enough to give me their perspective. Okay, number five. These all tie together. Number five, I think a council meeting is supposed to be run with complete openness and candor. Total truth, uh, total openness, nothing is, um, um, I don't want to say hidden, like there'd be something nasty going on. If you're on my church council, you should be able to know about absolutely anything and everything in this church. And if you're on my council, the reason that you're on my council is because I want someone to talk to about anything and everything in my church. For us, and it doesn't have to be for you, for us, that even included at times, I needed to talk about individual people and use names and tell some parts of stories. People don't need to know everything, and I didn't, if there was, you know, something that had gone on that was just heartbreaking and completely inappropriate, I would say, well, you know, um, they're just... This is not a good time for, 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 for George, his relationship with the Lord. He's got a lot of things to sort out. So I think you can say some things in a careful way. But uh, if you're on my church council, then you're going to hear the real stuff. And in some ways, my church council, I, I was almost as more free to talk to them than I was even to my pastoral team. That's not totally accurate. What do I mean? Well, who did I talk about my pastoral team to? That's my point. The council didn't have to know the counseling issues, the specific stumble points or sins or things that went on. That's something I would, we would deal with in our pastoral team. But I wanted the council to know everything that was going on with our staff and how we were relating that way. So great openness, great candor. But number six, that means we only talk about any of this at the council meeting. Now, you know, if the world is ending or if you need to shoot me or hang me or something like that because I've been such an idiot, by all means, get together and talk about it. But in our council, you are not free to have three of the council get together at Bob's house, have some barbecue, and talk about your thoughts about the church or about the council meeting. We don't do that. I don't talk about the council meeting when you're not around, and don't you talk about the council meeting when I'm not around. We talk about it together, or we don't talk. And I really ask them, if you can't do that, then you're not, uh, you're not welcome to be on this. And of course, number seven, Everything's confidential, and that is the deal breaker. If you feel as a council member that you must tell somebody who isn't on the council something, then that's because you feel like you must resign from being on the council, period. And uh, I would say it, it, it really, it worked very well through the years. I appreciated very much having a council that would tell me no because I'm a wild guy. And if you don't tell me no, I'm just gonna kinda keep going, but I don't wanna have to keep 
in a sense, double-checking myself. I mean, before the Lord, yes. But if I don't have confidence that you're going to say, you know, Daniel, I think you're getting a little bit beyond yourself. I don't feel safe. And that, for me, was the greatest gift of the council, that they really were for me, they were really, really, but they would also say, I think you're nuts, in so many words. Okay? So I have just one other thought, but any questions about this on the council stuff? I, I don't, yeah, Louis? You mentioned being meticulous about inc even including the meal, what happened with that. But what about like when you're going on the, I guess with the minutes, when you would be having to address something that's happening by name within the church, is that something that would show up within the minutes as well? Or? If So if I'm dealing with a, yeah. Does George's name show up in the minutes? If it, because he's done some something sinful or something like that? No. The council, the reason that I would talk to them is because we're going to have to make a staff change. And I want you to know ahead of time why we're making this staff change. Uh, but I would not want anyone to be uncovered. Sure. Yeah. So the, the minutes would read, uh, Pastor explained some of the challenges in George's personal life that made it difficult for him to continue as a staff member, something like that, yeah. And the, I'm, I was also pretty tight about the council's purview is not everything in the church. Their main thing is the uh, uh, financial accountability and matching funds with the vision and making sure the business of church is taken care of. I do not believe that I go to the council submitting ultimately vision for the church or style of how I pastor to that group of people. But I, if I'm going to get money to pay for the vision, they're the people that I've got to, I've got to convince. But I didn't involve them in what would traditionally be called a pastoral type issues in people's lives. I think it never hurts to keep people covered as long as we say enough that people know. Yes, ma'am. Um, back before your seven points, I missed the somehow I didn't get the two things. Yeah. Um, you said that you were going to talk about what is going on. But what was number two? Uh, number two was uh, kind of keeping the finances really above board, to have regard for what's honorable in the sight of God and man. So you are uh, protecting the integrity, the financial integrity of the church. That's number two. And number one is you are uh, going with the leader to see the future and then bringing back a great report so that the whole congregation can say, all right, I guess we can do it. Is, is that clear then? Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Can you talk about some of the seasons um, that shift? I mean, I, I'm very aware it's very different to have a, a smaller church plan and you have a church council and you have a church with a staff that's full functioning. And they're, they're, they're very, same principles apply. Yeah. Question, however, yeah. The practical portion of how they might lay out. Because you probably, even in here, I think we have a lot of different, uh, you know, kind of. There's a little bit difference between the two. How does somebody, what you share, apply to that? Okay, I've only got one hearing aid in. I'm pointing to the wrong ear. <laughs> so I think that, <laughs> yeah, it's only partly occupied, so plenty of room. If, if I'm hearing what you're saying, it's more so a different size church or a, a newer church yeah, yeah. council. Mm -hmm. Yes. They just started this week. You know? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, there is a difference. I'm going to sound like I'm saying the opposite, but for a newer church, a church plant, a smaller congregation, resist the temptation to get a council too soon. Um... It's not like they become evil or something when they become uh, council, 
But to me, a council is a group of people. We've really, in some kind of a long-term relationship, and we have a desire to bless this congregation and to, and to find everything that God has for us. I think that just takes a little bit of time. So a year, two years before I had a council, uh, I would say that's probably a good idea. However, my understanding was always that if a church does not have a designated council, then, uh, well, and kind of the old, then I think the divisional leader should become a reference point. And in times past, I required that of churches without a council. You send me your agenda as though you had a council. And you send me your monthly report, and then we can talk about it if there's any issue. Uh, so don't be in a hurry. But then, switch to the other side, I find that, that inviting people onto my council is one of the very best discipling arrangements I could possibly have because I get to explain the, how we think about things and what we're up to and why we do A, B, and C, and there's this scripture and that scripture and all so maybe you would begin with a more informal. I just want to ask if you would be willing to meet with me once a month. Eventually, this might become something like a council, but I just really covet this, this time with you. So work into it slowly. People have to be trained to be good council members. Just because you're a good businessman actually can make you a bad council member because you just think about business. That's not the kingdom. So you're going to be discipling people into this whole process. And I don't think you need a large council if, uh, if your congregation is, is uh, normal size. Some people call it small. It's normal. The average, do you know the average four square church, average four square church is 57 people. 900 of the four square churches, and we've got like 1,600 left, <laughs> we keep losing, are under 60. That's normal. And there are some of us, Ralph Moore, myself, and a few others who are trying to cast a different vision for the future of, of church. Uh, to me, a council would be maybe three people. And that would be great. Mm -hmm. So did that kind of answer your question? or I mean, it could be five people. I, I, I love inviting, please join me for leadership. I'll take you, yeah, come on, come on. And then you just train them. Okay, other, uh, yes ma'am, or sir. Are you saying that you pick the council and the congregation has nothing to do with it? Okay, thank you, fabulous question. Uh, if you, I don't know if you know this, but historically, up until I'm going to say 15, 20 years ago, all council members of Foursquare churches were elected by the congregation. Different church, there was nothing spelled out about how these people would be nominated, but they were voted upon by the members of the Foursquare church. And that, frankly, served us very well for a long time, and a good many Foursquare churches still do that. I, I don't even know what the percentage is. I think it's probably still the majority. About 20 years ago, a number of people, pastors, especially of churches that were larger, where the congregation didn't even know each other, uh, they basically said, how can we have a vote on council members when people don't know who these individuals are. It just becomes a popularity contest or whoever got their photo taken. Gee, those are, that's a cute outfit. Yeah, I'll vote for, vote for her. There was no basis for making the vote. And so then over time, it got, it got, the bylaws got shifted a little bit that the council members now can be uh, uh, voted on or ratified is the language that a lot of people use. And that generally means that the pastor and existing council have come up with a, a list of names and then amongst themselves have decided, I think for this season, it would be really great to have these people and those are presented to a congregation for a vote of ratification 
rather than election. But I will, I mean, I, I haven't been pastoring now for almost seven years, so perhaps it's changed. That's still a gray area because we're in the process of, of shifting. We happily elected ours for many years, and then it did reach a size where it was kind of ridiculous. And so I got permission from the supervisor to change it to ratification. I don't know even if churches are seeking permission from their supervisor anymore. Maybe they're just doing it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, did, so did that answer your question? It's a bit different. Uh, Foursquare's polity is a little bit different, say, than, than Baptist or Assemblies of God in that our church council is not the same as a church board. Very, very different uh, entities. So if your background is uh, on a church board or a church that's run by a board, uh, let me just encourage you to get educated because that isn't how we think about our church council at all. Yeah. Is there a follow-up or did that, was that adequate answer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question to follow up on that. Does that have to be, if, if you are, if you want to have a change, then it has to be Well, I'm doing this from I'm doing this from limited resource of memory, but I do think that the bylaws have been changed and this word ratification is in there. How that gets interpreted might be still a little questionable, but there's a lot of things in the bylaws that how you interpret it gives you a little wiggle room. I think we're trying to chart a, a narrow course between two extremes and both of these are deadly where you have a pastor who really just wants a, a rubber stamp approval of you know, friends, relatives, and the dog who will say, yes, sir, yes, sir, oh, yes, ma'am, amen, yes, sister, preach it, and that's it. And that will scuttle a church eventually. It's, it's horrific. On the other side are the, um, the controlling council or board, uh, council members who say, I was here before you got here. I'll be here after you're gone, Pastor. That is death. So we don't want a pastor who just nominates her chums and people that always go along with her, but neither do we want the council to be configured almost by random or a few strong personalities in the church that get a lot of votes and the reason they got a lot of votes is not because it's a, a spiritual giant. They just uh, have things. So how do we navigate that? That's the issue. And so I think churches are finding their, their way in the midst of that. Okay, my last thought, because it's 820, and I can feel <laughs> the energy has diminished somewhat. I'll just say it this way uh, to the council members. You have a very unique opportunity, almost an intimate opportunity, to step into uh, the pastor's life and help carry burdens and loads that your pastors have been carrying for a long time on their own. Any pastor that's worth her or his salt is not looking for somebody to give him a free ride. Hopefully, your pastor got in this business because they are burden bearers, because they're servants, because they go the extra mile and they just do what needs doing no matter what. One of the burdens that we carry in this business is finances. Certainly the finances for the whole church, but finances for my kids need tennis shoes. And I, my, I can't do it. I have no salary. I'm not suggesting that you should bankrupt your church in order to let your pastor live high on the hog. But I am saying that the burden to care for your pastor, I think, is something that you can do in prayer and something you can do by decisions that you make 
that are very powerful and very spiritual. In this regard of caring for your pastor, you are more of a leader of the church than the pastor is. Does that make sense? The pastor can't really, well, I mean, sometimes we get forced to say, I just can't do it. Can, is there any way I can get a raise? That's not your pastor's job. I would beg you, find out and make sure that your pastor with the arrangement, the staff and things like that, what can be done to help carry a burden of them having faith for their own finances for a long, long time. And perhaps it's appropriate for the church itself to carry a burden of faith for finances and not have the pastor be the primary one to do that. Does that make sense? I'm not saying pay them all $200,000 a year. But, and this has to do with, with birthdays and just appreciation for what they do. And I think that's your job. Take care of the people that are taking care of you. The scripture is, let him who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. The laborer is worthy of the hire. And we know we're getting to a place in the life of Foursquare, maybe the whole church. I predict within 10 years that 85% of all of our pastors will be bivocational. It's a weird thing that's happening now. It's just like money, the money stream for funding full-time Christian workers. It's just, it's just disappearing everywhere. But I don't think we have to rush into that. <laughs> so take care of your pastors as well as you can and have faith. Have faith for them. Okay, I think that's... Uh